A big hello to all our viewers. My name is Shireen Idikula. I'm the clinical director of Play Street Bangalore, India. I'm also a speech and language therapist, a feeding therapist, and a movement therapist. Play Street is an organization that provides educational services to help the child with special needs become independent and live up to his or her own potential. We offer a lot of parent empowerment programs, an integrated schooling program, and a variety of clinical services. Now, as part of Autism Awareness and Acceptance Month in April, we wanted to bring you the pioneers in the field of autism to guide us and spread more awareness and knowledge. So today is our 14th talk and our remarkable speaker for today is Miss Bridget Nicholson. Bridget is an occupational therapist and an assistive technology consultant with over 34 years of experience. She has provided extensive consultation, support and training to school districts and organizations. She presents highly effective full day international interactive workshops for educators, therapists, teachers and parents. These presentations include science based approaches and research as well as powerful strategies and tools which impact learning for all children. Bridget, thank you so much for agreeing to join us for Play Street's Autism Hour today. We are honored to have you here. Thank you so much, Shireen. I'm very honored that you invited me. And I'm, so, I think you have a wonderful lineup of speakers. I'm, I'm very eager to hear myself what's happening with Autism Hour in, uh, in April. Lovely. So let's get started. Today's topic is the effect of rhythm on learning. And this is such an interesting topic personally for me because it, it's in the past few years I've learned the importance of rhythm um, in learning. So I'm quite excited to get going and you know bring that information out to everybody. So let's start with the first question, which is what is the relationship between the brain and rhythm and also between the body and rhythm? Well, thank you. I think your, your first questions that have to do with how the brain and the body works is essential. Very, very important. So I think that most people don't understand how essential the concept or the ability to follow a rhythm is. I think a lot of people think that rhythm is maybe if you're listening to music, I'm going to, this might be a little loud. I hope it's not, but if you're clapping along, that's a beat. And rhythm and beat are very closely related. And so rhythm is the ability to be able to follow a beat or follow a, a tone and follow along at the right timing. And when you think of the brain and you think of rhythm, we think often of music. Or we think maybe if we're doing an exercise and we have to keep up with that exercise with the right rhythm. But actually, rhythm is essential in the brain because rhythm, children that have research has shown that children that have better concept of rhythm and that children that are better able to tap along with the rhythm, those are the children that read better and that have, have um, higher level of reading skills. And those are the children that can write rhythmically, they can write at a higher level or they can write more efficiently. So when you think of the brain, and you think of rhythm and music, you actually have to also think of reading and you have to think about the eyes following along with words and following along and reading those words in a rhythmic manner. And then you end up, the more that children can read rhythmically, the better they are at actually reading and reading more efficiently and the same with writing. So that looks at what's happening in the brain with, with getting reading from a page or being able to write with rhythm. But then when you think of the body, the body has something called an autonomic nervous system and it has feedback loops. And I'm going to not use a lot of the actual terminology, but essentially the, the body is part of that neurological system of the brain. And so you really actually cannot separate out the body and the brain. One of the reasons that I created the, the rhythmic movement and the rhythmic learning program that I did was because the thing that I'm seeing happen in education is I'm seeing people teaching to the brain. And I often do this with my hand and I do this as a visual. And the reason is in education, what I'm seeing is we're teaching the head. We're kind of separating this child's body and they we're teaching to the head. We're giving them um, information they need to read and we're giving children information they need to learn and understand. We want them to sit still and be quiet and stop moving their body. And we want them to just learn in their brain. 
And the fact is, the body is equally as important because the body, and I'm, I'm using my hands to explain this because I really need you to understand these concepts. The body, the entire body from the toes all the way up to here are feeding information into the brain 100% of the day. Um, it's very subconscious, but what's happening in the body is affecting the brain all the time and rhythm is really essential in that. And I just wanna really say that there, is, there are many, many research studies that talk about, that really show, that prove that children that develop rhythm really cope better academically, that it improves their focus and their attention, it improves their ability to, I know these are big words, but they, they modulate their sympathetic and their autonomic nervous system. And what that does is that those nervous systems and the nerves that run throughout the whole body, it actually helps children with autism. Once they learn how to follow a rhythm and once they develop their rhythm skills, it actually helps that entire neurological system to become more regulated and more controlled. There are lots of studies. I, I don't have time to really talk about all of these, but the, 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 the relationship between rhythm and learning is very strong and it's shown very, very strongly in the, in the research. Amazing. I, I mean, I completely agree with you because I'm seeing those differences uh, when we care, you know, we do rhythmic programs here too. Um, so completely in agreement with you there. Okay, so the second question is this, is it difficult for children with autism to tune into rhythm? We have noticed that they try to create the movement patterns like stimming, which are non-constructive or not very purposeful, but still could be rhythmic. They have a rhythm to their own stimming, but how, do these movements help our children and why are children not able to create more purposeful rhythmic movements? So I think that there is a, um, there, there's not a there, there's some disagreement with different people about about um, self stim um, self stimulation movements and movements that are repetitive movements that we really see as self stimulation type movements. Um, I really see them as maladaptive self -stimula stimulatory behaviors. In other words, when I say maladaptive. I think that they are detrimental and they really do not help children become more functional. So what we're really talking about, if you don't, if you don't uh, know what we're, the self stim movements we're talking about, some children with autism will kind of sit in a corner and they'll do this kind of movement or they'll play with their hair or they'll, they'll sit and they'll maybe rock their bodies really strongly. And these movements are repetitive they often are rhythmic because they're doing them over and over again. They're not always rhythmic with good rhythmic timing, but they're rhythmic in that they do those movements over and over again. And they really are self-stimulating and it really is helping some children use those movements to help regulate their bodies because I'm, I'm telling you really strongly, not only from the research, but from all of my years of experience and Shireen, you're saying you're seeing this as well. When we help children's bodies, become regulated and we help their bodies learn how to move to a rhythm that impacts the way that the brain functions and it impacts the regulation in the brain and in in turn it affects the output of the brain and the output is going to be things like the way the child behaves the way they respond the way that they um the way that their their emotion their emotional response even just their ability to actually sit and talk to other people so I believe that we need to help children move away from those movements. And I'm just going to use this movement, but every, every kid has a different movement. There's all kinds of different movements that children have. And I think we should help those children develop other movements that are more purposeful movements. So the program that I, I, I'm going to talk somewhat about the program I developed, but there's a lot of rhythmic movement options and opportunities. There's just not a lot of structured rhythmic programs out there that are ready made for people to use. And that's the reason I created a highly structured rhythmic movement program that has different levels. So it starts up at level one, goes all the way up to level four. And if you take, if you take a child with autism who's doing these maladaptive or these negative behaviors and movements, and you start teaching them how to do rhythmic movements that are more purposeful 
And it's not just, no, you're not just going to take one movement away and then teach them one other movement. You start teaching a whole range of movements and they purposeful movements. So for instance, crossing of the midline movements, if you're a therapist, you know that crossing of midline, I'm just doing this simple thing, this looks simple. So I'm taking my hand and I'm crossing the midline like this and I'm taking my hand and crossing the midline. That looks like a simple movement, but I'll tell you what, from a therapy standpoint and from a neurological standpoint and from the way that that child's brain and body is functioning, that I can tell you right now, there's 10 different benefits and probably more to doing that simple movement. So I would take a child that's sitting there and doing this and they're totally lost from the environment and they're totally separated from the environment. And I would teach them how to do rotation movements like this and do it over and over again and do it with a multimedia type of uh, program. And I don't want those to become STEM behaviors, but I want them to become movements that actually help grow the brain. So I think that I would take children that are doing self stem movements and move them through a very regular, highly structured rhythmic movement program so that we can teach them to do more purposeful movements that actually help with their brain development instead of repetitive maladaptive movements that actually take children away. When children are sitting and they're doing this, they're totally in their own mind, they're in their own brain, and they're not interacting with their environment, either people in the environment or the objects and their environment around them. So just because you mentioned stimming, I just want to ask one more thing. It is um, when you talk about stimming and a lot of children stim because they have a need to, they, it's important because it's their way of regulating themselves too. Um, so it's not that parents should like say, no, don't do that. Yes. But kind of give them movements that they could do that would be more beneficial for their brain. Exactly. I actually, I'm really pleased you brought that up because I, I don't think it's good to say to children when a child is doing some kind of negative, repetitive movement, I don't think it's good for parents to be saying, stop doing that, don't do that. That's a bad thing to do. I don't want you doing that. What you really want to do is you want to distract that child, maybe get them to a place. I would love to see children doing my program where they love the program so they want to be doing it because it's fun and they enjoy it. And then if a parent says, okay, it's time to go and do this rhythmic movement program, then they, they would get up from doing what they're doing and go and participate in that. I just have to tell you this fantastic study done in 1997 which is not that long ago. If you're my age, 1997 is not too far, far away. <laughs> it was done at the University of North Texas. And what they did, it's, it's a very complex title of this whole study. But basically what they did was they took children who were participating in a lot of self stim behaviors, and they actually had those children jogging right before an academic activity. So those children did jogging. So jogging is, you know, running with a very rhythmic kind of a pace. That's what mm -hmm. jogging is. And those children, what it says in the study is that they had sharp reductions in maladaptive self-stimulatory behaviors immediately following the jogging. In other words, if children were jogging with, and I, I, the reason I'm doing this is because I want you to understand, jogging is not like, like fast running because fast running is not rhythmic. Jogging is rhythmic. When you're jogging, you're slowly running at a very rhythmic pace. And those children, the moment they were done jogging, they sat down and their behaviors were much lower than beforehand. And that was a, rhythm, that was a research study done. That's not just me saying that. I see that happening, but that's a research study that was done at the University of North Texas. And, and thank you for sharing that it's research because that's... Uh, I think it's important for parents and professionals to know that there is research backing all of this. Um, and it's not just us making it up <laughs> that this is beneficial. Everything, um, everything that I am doing, everything I do and that I teach on, I have multiple research studies to back it up. And then my program that I've put together, I have two groups that are actually running a research, formal research on my program. I have a group in a country called Mauritius. I'm not sure if a lot of people know where that is. It's a small country in the Indian Ocean. The, the Ministry of Education in Mauritius is running a year-long research study on my program. And then there's actually a, 
a young lady in India, and I, I forget where she is in India, but she's a graduate student and she's um, using my program as her as part of her graduate studies to do a research project on on the effect of my program on children's development. So I, I'm saying that because everything I've put together is research based, but then I within a year or so I'm going to have some really nice research to show the effects of the program that I've created online. Awesome. And we are looking forward to that, to have that. So too. am I. So yeah. am I. <laughs> okay. Um, let's move on to the third question. So there are some studies that say up to 80% of children with autism have motor coordination deficits. So now what is the impact of motor coordination deficits in our children? Can these deficits be addressed if our children learn to create more purposeful movements integrated with rhythm? So I will say um, the, the very quick answer to the second part of that question. So can these deficits be addressed if our children learn to create more purposeful movements integrated with rhythm? The answer is a very strong yes. Um, I've seen that over 34 years of doing this with children. If we teach purposeful movements and if we have children engage in regular rhythmic movement, it absolutely will affect children's um, coordination and their rhythm. And actually, it, it actually affects a lot more than coordination. So when you think of coordination, if I take something like this glass of water and I drink it, we think that's simple, but it's actually not really simple. There's a lot of coordination that goes into the timing of picking up that glass, the timing of holding it, picking it up, if it's a really heavy glass with a lot of water, or if it's a small glass with a little bit of water, the amount of pressure we need to hold that, and then to get it up to our mouth, and then there's coordination of this whole mouth and swallowing. So the reason I'm saying that is because as parents, and I'm the parents of two children who are now young adults, one of them has autism and has we have significant issues with autism. So I understand autism from a parent point of view. And then I have one with ADHD. So I understand all of the challenges from, a, from a, a parent, a lot of challenges, maybe not all of them from a parent perspective. And I've worked with children like this, the, all of these children for 34 years. And I'm saying this because we underestimate how important coordination is. And it's not just coordination, it's rhythm. It's the ability to actually time everything because the timing of doing all of that is important. So when we start working on rhythm, we're actually not only training motor coordination, we're training a very wide range of skills that actually impact that child's entire neurological system and it impacts the way that their child regulates. So for instance, if I pick up that glass of water and I drink it once, or I do it, maybe if I'm drinking a whole glass of water and I might do it 10 times, that's not a lot of repetition. It's not a lot of work. It's not a lot of movement. It's a little bit of movement. But if I take a child every single day for 10 minutes before they read or for 10 minutes before they write, and I do something like if I do jumping jacks, and I have to do this to show you because I'm doing a lot of these. I'm not just doing one. I could spend 30 seconds and I could do... 30 jumping jacks, which is a lot more than just picking up this one glass and drinking it, which means if I do repetitive rhythm, rhythmic movements with my child for 10 minutes before they read or for 10 minutes before they write, we're doing a lot of repetitive movements with rhythm. And what that does is that that not only improves their coordination, it will, it will actually improve their learning. It will improve their focus and their concentration. It improves their self-regulation, their ability to actually understand all those autonomic signals and systems in their body. And it ultimately allows them to sit and learn more effectively. And I'm breathing heavily because I just did 10 jumping jacks. No, I, I was amazed that you're talking and doing that. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you would like a few seconds uh, in the meantime. No, keep talking. It's yeah, fine. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go to the fourth question then. So how is sensory processing, motor skills, and rhythmic motor coordination connected in typical development? And then how is it different for all children with autism? You know, we've just recently started seeing studies that come out that show 
that there are actually for children in autism. And I, the one thing I haven't learned yet I, I, is whether this is the case with all children with autism, but there have been studies. It was a, a, an article in the um, Frontiers of Integrative Neuroscience published in 2013 that really shows that um, there, there are areas in the cerebellum, certain lobes in the cerebellum that really are different in children that have autism. And we, you know, autism really was never seen as a, uh, as having a primary motor disorder, but we're starting to see that now a lot more in the research. And so children's motor skills, physical skills, when you have children with autism, um, and I've seen this for years, long before the research was showing this, children who have autism have a lot more difficulty with motor control, unless we all know one of the most one of the most um, important characteristics of autism is that children have very specific areas of skill and very specific areas of interest or really maybe the word obsessions is a little bit strong but for some children it, it really is an obsession so for some children a very small portion of the population of children with autism they may have a very strong interest in something like i don't know riding bmx bicycles or they might be very uh, adept and skilled at climbing large, huge mountains. So for a very small group of children with autism, those are children where from a very early age, they have a very specific interest in something that is a motor or a physical skill, and they become very good at that. But the interesting thing is, that child might be fantastic at riding a BMX bicycle, but really bad at a whole lot of other sports because they've really developed that one specific skill through lots and lots of repetition, which actually makes me understand that the more we do rep rep repetitive rhythmic movements, we can help children develop those, those motor skills and their motor coordination. So I think for children in autism, um, one, of the, one of the very strong characteristics is that children with autism don't regulate their internal systems very well. And they also are not able to cope with their external environment and the sensory input from their external environment. So there are parts of our nervous system, it's called the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Those different parts of the nervous system, they're all subconscious. But the child, it might be something as simple as like a tag on the back of their clothing. There might be a tag. Or even like I'm looking at, I've got sleeves here that are a little bit long on me. Those are things that for children with autism, that might, and, and it's totally subconscious, they're not, able to under, they're not able to feel that sensation and really cope with it because there's this exaggerated response in their body. So children with autism, it's, it's very clear that their sensory processing is, is disturbed and it's not, it's not, it's not as typical as other children. And I, I hate to use the word typical because really there's a, an entire spectrum of, of functioning. And it's not like one child is definitely um, on the autism spectrum and another child is definitely not. There, there's, there's aspects of different functionings that are you know, more or less on that whole spectrum. But, but the fact is uh, more children with, with uh, autism have difficulty with their sensory processing and most of them, the majority of children, those children have difficulty with their motor skills as well as their rhythm and their coordination. Right, okay. Um, so, I mean, I, I see that when you said like, they're very good with biking. I know kids who are very good swimming, um, that like, like they can go uh, all the way, state championships, national championships, international, they can do that, but they have so much of difficulty tying their shoe, for example. Or, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It, it's They're, like these islands of skill, mm -hmm. and you just cannot believe how, how competent they are in those things, and then other normal life things that they're just not able to cope with. So is that like a difficulty because those connections are not built uh, in children with autism is that like okay you've got really good development there but something's not happening here and so that's why you know the crossing midline activities are so important because there's a lot of interhemispheric integration then and then you get a lot more neuronal connections to connect to those other islands in the brain and get them moving yes i i 
I agree. Those, and, and I think the, the, the question is, really, when we look at those children that, or children and adults, really, it doesn't matter what age they are, the vast majority of children with autism or that they vary, they're definitely identified as being on the autism spectrum, whether it's whatever level of functioning they are, if they have developed, um, the vast majority of those children have difficulty with sensory processing, sensory regulation, responses to their internal and their external environment. And they also have difficulty with motor skills and movement and coordination and control of their movement. A lot of those children have something called a temporal timing disability or challenge. In other words, temporal meaning, people often think temporal means brain, but actually temporal means timing. There's, there's a, a huge part of the brain and the body that has to control and understand timing. And it's actually a very complex skill. And children with autism have a lot of difficulty with that sense of timing. Um, and it actually proves to us those children that really become good at something, they become really good at, you, you mentioned swimming, but they don't even know how to tie their shoelaces or they, they bump into things and they're not able to, when they in early childhood, they're not able to stack blocks the same as others and they're not able to write very well for their age expectations, but they could be fantastic at some kind of other sport. That to me is absolute proof that constant practice and repetition makes a huge difference. I think that people who practice excessively or extensively, I'm going to use the word extensively, the people that practice extensively for some kind of a physical, something like for the Olympics, for instance, to become an athlete at the Olympics, they can only get to that level if they do it for hours every day. And I couldn't even imagine. I, for me, it's not something I could do, but there's a, there are people that do that because that's what they're passionate about. And what it shows me for children with autism is that it is absolutely possible if we use rhythmic movement every day, but we do it carefully. We can't just say, okay, we're just going to do jumping jacks every day. It's, it's, there's a whole program and there's a whole structured program that we need to follow. And we need to grade it and it needs to go from simple to more complex and then more complex and the visual has to be become more complex and the auditory input has to become more complex. And if we do that regularly and we do it frequently and we do it for long enough, we will absolutely see differences in the way that that child's brain and their body is integrating and in the way that they're growing. For me, that kind of regular rhythmic physical input into that body is one of the most powerful things we can do for all of our children or every single one of our children, children with special needs, children that have not been identified with special needs, children that are supposedly typically developing children. I think every child, we are building their brains if we use regular rhythmic movement. And it's honestly the reason I have thrown myself into this whole project of developing a very highly structured rhythmic movement and rhythmic learning program um, that I want to create and put online and do as much training as I can, because I believe so strongly in this uh, approach to helping children with their learning and their achievement. Sorry, that was the long, the long answer. No, to that no, it's brilliant, because you can really uh, hear the passion in your voice. And that's exactly what um, parents also need to hear that because I've done it, I'm seeing the changes, I want to share that uh, information with all of you out there. That's the passion I hear in your voice, and that's fantastic. Um, so, I mean, when you talked about timing, sequencing, I can understand because that's what speech is at the end of it. And as a speech therapist, that's exactly what we need to get to, right? And, exactly. and that's actually connecting to our next question which is can rhythmic movements calibrate the relationship of our children's bodies with their environment so that it leads to some improvement in their social and communication abilities? I, I think that is a, an, a fantastic question because honestly, that word calibrate, I love the word calibrate. As a matter of fact, I, I'm surprised I didn't even use it earlier because that's, it's really just what I was saying is that if you constantly have if children constantly work on their bodies it's going to affect the brain and it's going to I, I do like the word calibrate because I feel like calibrate sounds like a 
a tool or a gear and it sounds like something that fits together and makes something work and it makes it work more finely and it more finely tunes that and that's what i see this as being is that i see that children with autism have very dysregulated sensory systems they see the tiniest little thing happen and then they overreact or they have the tiniest little sensation you know some children with with autism if you do something like this they actually see it as being painful if you take the if you actually rub their head, their arms this way rubbing against the hair on their arms they actually see that as it's a painful feeling for them and so i i think that calibrating the way that their neurological systems um work is is essential and i don't think we can calibrate it by having children sit down you know i tell you what i'm a very big believer in technology for children i really am i'm sitting here working with you talking to you all and i have three screens in front of me there i have my ipad in front of me and i have my phone i have five screens in front of me and i will tell you as much as i believe in the effectiveness of technology for children we cannot be teaching our children by sitting them down in front of more technology and telling them to have their bodies be quiet and sit and listen and be quiet and learn that is not the way our children should be learning and we should be using technology we absolutely need to be using and and i'm not saying children need to have access to lots of technology there, there's lots of different kinds of simple technologies that are out there that we should be using with our children but the way that we calibrate their bodies and their brains is by you doing it through their bodies because the, the the feedback from the body into the brain is exceptionally powerful and once we start doing that that what you were talking about shireen that whole thing of rhythm and sequencing for being able to talk talking is a rhythm and a sequence now we're not talking like robots so it's not like a specific beat that's like a you know 80 beats per minute and now i'm going to talk like this that's not the way we talk but there is still a specific rhythm there are syllables in words and there are there are sounds and you know you look you listen to the way children with autism talk they'll talk with a flat monotone they don't um, have intonation they don't have interesting sounds in their voice and some of our children with autism will talk like this that is a perfect example of a child that just doesn't have the ability to understand rhythm in their body. So I think, um, yes, rhythmic movements can definitely calibrate the child's body so that it improves their social and their communication um, abilities. And all of that helps children in their daily life, in their daily living. It helps them interact with objects. They're not gonna spill their, their water as much. They're not gonna drop their food. They're gonna eat more cleanly they're not going to drop their food all over the place as much as they used to they're going to be able to calm their body so that they can talk to other people i think it 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 has massive benefits when we work on children's bodies absolutely i completely agree um just from personal experience i can say see again we are not a speech therapist taught from the beginning like oh you have to this is important right body and we just look straight at the mouth and say we have to talk you have to talk you have to work on this right as a skill um and it's just in the past uh few years that i've really understood oh my god we have to get to the body to get to the mouth and without doing that and initially we we're looking at movement there's like even movement is just not enough we have to get a rhythm into our body and exactly. not just getting a movement and everything we do in life even when we're sleeping it's rhythmic whether we're breathing it's rhythmic uh, when you're moving around there is there, there is movement and there's rhythm to everything we do in life but somehow that part gets missed out as being the crux and the foundation of um, helping children learn better so it's i mean i'm so thankful that you you know after attending your webinars actually is when i kind of like started putting it together for speech and it's like actually yes that's such a big connection to speech and that's when i started telling parents you know you've got to connect the two because i have like you mentioned a lot of children who go into a monotonous voice and who have no prosody no rhythm to their speech and it's like a robot speaking yes um, and and that's when i realized oh my god they they have no rhythm in their body itself i can see their movement that itself is so difficult how is it going to come here 
Exactly. Yeah, lovely. Okay. And, and you know, those are children who are just not confident in everything. They're not confident in speaking to other people. They're not confident with giving their opinions and using their voice. And they're not confident with their bodies. So those are the children that are going to have a closed posture like this. And they're not going to be looking straight at people. And they're not going to, you know, when you're interacting with people and you talk to someone like this and you're like, hey, how are you? That shows confidence and it shows eye contact and it shows the ability to communicate. But our children that are not confident with their movement and their communication, those are the children that are sitting and doing their self stim because that's what helps them regulate instead of interacting with their world. Yeah. I'm, I am very passionate about this whole topic. I think we can help our children so much with so many different areas and it's not just rhythmic movement. It's, it's really looking at a whole developmental approach to the way that we expect children to learn how to read and write. Right. And a big part of that is rhythm and movement. Absolutely. All right. So now can learning with rhythm uh, improve, enhance posture, movement, and perception? And you were just talking about reading and writing. So it just kind of ties in there. And if, if yes, what kind of movements are we looking at here to create uh, in our children? So I, I think the best way that I could answer this question and possibly some of the others is to really show you some things on the screen because I could explain this, but I think it's easier if I actually show you some of these things. Great. That would be great. Is that okay? Yes. Yep. So um, I know you have a number of other questions, but I'm going to give you a quick overview of you know, what's more important, and I really honestly, I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen right now because what I really want to very clearly make a comment about is this. The reason that I've developed this entire curriculum is because I see the need for a developmental approach that includes a bottom up. So I'm actually saying from the toes all the way up to the brain. We need to start with the body and then get to the brain. We cannot have children from the youngest age working on learning materials that go straight to their brain. We need to be working with the body. So what I did was I created this whole program. I've put it online for free for absolutely anybody to use. And my goal now is to really get out and do lots and lots of training because it's become very comprehensive and very big. But what's most important for me is to teach about the concepts. You don't have to use my program. You can use any program you want. I, that, I don't know that there's a lot of rhythmic movement programs out there. I actually, as a matter of fact, there, there's virtually nothing that I know of. That's the reason I created this. So what I'm trying to do is explain the concepts. I'm not trying to say to you, go and use my program. <laughs> because I just created it because I was talking about concepts, but there was nothing out there for people to use. But everything that I've created is online and available for anybody to use. And I would love to get out and do some in-person full-day trainings and workshops on this. That would be my dream, actually, to go and do this. But anyway, that's beside the point. So what I'm talking about here is brain, body, and technology. And the reason I talk about brain, body, and technology is because I still do believe that our children do need technology for learning, and, but we need to absolutely be looking at how we're using their brain and their body before we start looking at how they're using technology. That's really the sequence. And so this is a full curriculum outline map that I use just to try and give an overview. And I definitely don't have time in these few minutes to talk about the entire thing. But one of the really, really, really big things I talk about constantly is evaluation and data. Because I'll tell you something, I've done this for so many years. I am not interested in doing anything ever with any child if there isn't data to show that it really works. We do not have time. For it, none of us have time to mess around with this idea and that idea and another idea if we don't show that it works. So for every single child, the data is essential. I've got lots of research that I can show you. I have links and links and links and pages of research that I can show you. But if you have a child, if you're a parent and you have one child with autism, or maybe you have more than one child that has special needs, you need to know that this is working for your child. So I talk a lot about data, 
and how, how we really measure what is working. But these are the three main areas that I talk about. And so when I talk about brain and body, I really look at how do we integrate the brain and body. And part of that is working on rhythmic movement. So one of that, one of these things is a highly structured rhythmic movement and sound program that I've put together and it's online for anyone to use. And then the other part of this is a developmental approach to teaching writing, which is also a program that I've put online. And then I'm going to do this one here in a different color. I'll do this one in red, a developmental approach to teaching reading. This one I have not put online yet because I haven't done it yet. It's just been too, too much work to do these others, but I am going to do a developmental approach to teaching reading, which has rhythmic eye movements and rhythmic eye tracking and rhythmic reading at some stage, as well as visual contrasts on the screen for uh, improving reading with visual contrast. But this is a program here that I've put online that's available for anybody to use. And I'll just do this in green. There are a whole lot of components. This one here is follow along videos. Those are videos that are online that have um, graded structured movements that children can follow and they fund videos for children to follow online. This here is called Daily Beats. Daily Beats, I was interested in one of your questions you had uh, later on, Shireen. One of your questions uh, related to what do you do with children that have difficulty integrating their vision as well as their auditory skills and their body? There's so much when a child is visually trying to look at something and they're trying to hear a beat or a rhythm and they're trying to make their body do this. So Daily Beats actually was created specifically for two purposes. It is a simpler program because there's nothing visually that you have to follow. There's no visual cues to follow. And it was also developed because I'm working in, um, I'm working actively in numerous schools and programs in South Africa and in Mauritius. And we're actually creating programs for children who don't have a lot of access to technology. Because there are gr huge big groups of children around the whole world that don't have projectors and smart boards and things like that in their classroom and they still need the opportunity to be using these programs and so that's specifically designed for children with less access to technology and then children where visually it's going to be a little bit confusing and then i've got two other programs as well ready for rhythm and ready for calm which i really don't have much time right now to explain because we need to move on to some other things so those are the um the programs and those are all available on, I'm going to um, bring it up here for you and show you where those are. On this website here called learningtools.co. And there, there is information on this website about what the program is. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger here. And I have to put, add in here. I have used this. It is very good. So for all the parents out there who would like to use it, please do, because I use it constantly for my movement programs, and it's amazing. So I've added a lot to this. I've added a lot more things to this program. Um, I don't know if you've used it recently, but it's growing very rapidly. Yep, it is. And I keep getting the updates and I'm just so excited to see all of this. <laughs> and the one thing I am starting to do is put a lot more training materials onto, this is not my, my uh, training site. This is just the site where if you want to go and use it with your children, you can use it with your children. But I do have a, um, I do have a website that is a training site that has information about all of my workshops and the courses that I do. And um, so it's, it's information. If you go to courses, you can actually get information about the different things that I'm teaching on. Lovely. So um, that is, that's really the rhythmic movement program. 
And then one of the other things that I have developed that I'm very excited about is this developmental approach to teaching writing. And let me tell you why I'm so excited about it is because as an, as an occupational therapist, these are concepts that I've taught about and that I've used with my, all of my students for over 34 years. But now what I'm doing is I'm taking all these concepts and putting them online as a curriculum so everyone around the whole world can use it. And so the developmental approach starts very early with things like body postures. And I know another one of your questions was about that. If we teach children how to maintain and hold body postures, that's another one of those things. Do you remember earlier when I said to you, if you cross the midline like this, I could mention like 10 benefits of just crossing the midline easily. It's the same with body pictures. If you put your children on a chair and you put them on their tummy on a chair and you tell them to act like Superman and put their hands in the air and hold Superman and then you all pretend you all do it in the family. All of you lie on a chair and, and, and pretend you're Superman and talk about what you're going to go and who you're going to go and rescue and help. There are so many benefits to doing static postures. You know, pretend like you're a frog and do sit like a frog and you don't want anyone eating you. So you've got to sit really still and don't let anybody, don't let any of those big birds out there come and eat you. So sit still so they don't see you. And then you sit like a frog and then you jump like a frog. These early body pictures are just vital for early learning. And then you go on to things like scribbling and early drawing and then later drawing. And it's a whole, it's a whole procedure of working children through body pictures and drawing. And then I do have on my website some really exciting um, videos that actually support the early drawing. And it is um, things like air drawing. These are all, children can then from an early age, learn how to draw lines down in the air and learn lines across in the air and circles and all of those early, early, we don't even call this writing. We just call it shape concepts and shape formation and the understanding of a shape. And if they can do all of these shapes in the air, and they can, and then we, like for instance, the square, they draw the shape in the air and then they see children with square pillows having a pillow fight. And then they draw another square and they see um, uh, the squares of a chess, a chess board. And then they draw another square, like it, it relates to normal real life. So I'm really excited about these um, early childhood developmental stages towards writing. Because I think if we can move children through their body feeling and understanding concepts in their world, then when we get down to the hand, creating a tiny little A and then a tiny B and a C, this is a very, very complex process. It looks simple, but having hands create little letters is actually very complex. And then putting those letters together to create words is extremely complex. And in so many cases, we have not done all of those early stages and move children through those early stages. And then we put a pen in their hand and we try and teach them how to write letters. So I, I just feel really strongly that we should be teaching a graded stage-based approach towards then getting to writing actual words. Absolutely. And not just for... Our children, but every child, I think every child should go through this process. Um, Absolutely, everyone. Yeah, because I know schools, unfortunately, at age three, four, five, they're looking at writing and their muscles are not even ready for writing and no. holding that pen. But no. um, I know parents who come and ask me, like, no, aren't they, aren't they supposed to start writing now? I mean, it's, um, you should teach them how to write. And I'm like, but they're only three. Why would you teach them now? <laughs> <laughs> However, there's a lot you can do at the age of three to get that, to not just get that child ready for writing, but to actually get them at, at such a good place for writing that by the time they start writing, they, they achieve and they feel good about themselves and they feel like they can do it. And then they're going to write something and be proud to show you what they've written. Right. That's what my goal is. I want children to be so excited about what they can do and to feel competent and to feel like they can do it. And so 
one of the big jobs that I do is by the time I see children that are 10 years old or 12 years old or 14, where they've become sad and demoralized and demotivated and they're not interested and they feel like they're dumb and that they're not good enough and they can't do things well enough. I actually take those kids, I still look at their age because I, I don't ever want to treat a 14 year old like a three year old ever. I want to do age appropriate and grade appropriate type activities, but I take them all the way back to some really early stages and I do some of those developmental approaches, but in more of a fun way for that age group. Um, and then we, we do much more multimedia type writing and reading and learning and repetition and, and repetition of information. Um, so there are lots and lots of strategies for making learning and achievement a lot more fun and helping children de develop their self-esteem. But we have to do it through stages. We just have to do it through a stage-based approach. I am very big on the whole stage-based approach. No matter what your child's age is, you have to go through stages to develop specific skills. Absolutely. I agree with you completely there um, because we tend to look at the final result. No, no, they should be doing this. So we just work on the skill there without really looking at all the foundations before that. And um, when would this program be out? Is it already ready or? It's all, it's all out. The, the, the biggest challenge I have is that the whole, the, so this program is, it's all developing rapidly. I literally every day I'm working with creating more and more content. It's all available. However, it's not really in, a, in an understand, it, it needs training. I, it's very hard to put something out and I'm, I am currently creating a lot of training material. Your question about is it available? Well, it really is all available online. Okay. Um, on, the on two the website? The two main websites you would have to go to mm -hmm. would be this one here, which is the um, learningtools.co. Mm -hmm. So that's where, that's where the programs are that children can use. It doesn't have information about the programs. Okay. And then the other one is my training website which is training.learningtools.co. Okay, all right. And that one is where I have information about workshops that are upcoming that I'm going to be doing, mm -hmm. as well as courses that are online that people can take. All right. So if anyone really wants to know more about what I'm doing, they can get onto this training.learningtools.co and they can, if they sign up, if they sign up here for more information, you get onto my mailing list and then anything I'm ever doing, I always send out right. on this, uh, from this site. Okay. Um, so one of the things I want to ask, like I, I have children who come to me and we can't start directly on rhythm because even the movement is so difficult. Like if you're saying crossing midline, most of my kids are just, you know, going straight out and not able to cross the midline. So where could parents start? Because, you know, Parents sometimes, and even professionals, tend to go into the doing. No, no, no. Do it this way. Do it, do it this way. Do it this way. Yes. Right? Yes. And uh, then the children get very agitated and, ah, I want to run away all the time. So where could they start? So I would, the, the, the two words that I use a lot with people is mirror and model. Okay. Yep. So this is why these are so important. I have created online videos that children can follow, which most children um, really love these videos. And I'm going to show you very, very briefly. They are videos that children can follow along with. So it might be something like space. There are children in the videos and then they on the screen and then the child standing here watches what the child is on the screen and they follow along. But that's not a good beginning starting point. What the good beginning starting point is mirror and model. So I'm just going to take this fun stuff here, the very, very first one. And the very first one is jump over the snake. So I'll show you this to this. I'll show you this briefly. Listen to the rhythm. The children are jumping over the snake. Okay. So what I would do is instead of just putting this video on and saying to kids, okay, you need to follow that video, 
you're right, Shireen, there's a lot of timing and a lot of things that children have to be able to do to do that. So what I would do as a parent or as a therapist or a teacher, as the adult, is I would say we're going to do model and mirror um, or mirror and model, either way. So what I would do is I would, first of all, watch the video with the kids. I wouldn't even try and do it. I would watch the video. We would talk about, hey, they're jumping over the snake. They, they don't want the snake to bite them. They don't want to hurt the snake. So they have to jump at the right time so they don't hurt the snake. And if they jump over the snake, then the snake's just going to go away and no, everyone will be happy. So you can have a whole story about jumping over a snake. And then we do mirror and model. So what I would do is I would do a fun thing with the kid and I'd say, okay, we're gonna pretend that we're gonna jump. So now every time I jump, you jump and the kid's right in front of me. We don't even have the screen anymore. And we say, okay, jump, stop, jump, stop, jump, stop. And you do it at that child's level. And then you start doing things like counting. Let's say you count every time you say one, so we go, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And the child's in front of you and you're doing it together. So there's that personal interaction with people and with the adult and with the teacher and then the child. And you talk about it and then you can say, what else can we jump over? What else could be coming towards that you jump over? So there could be some fantasy and some discussion and some thinking about what else can this be that we have to jump over. Um, and then you could even include clapping. So you could say, every time I clap loud, you have to jump. So it's jump, two, three, four, jump, two, three, four, jump, two, three, four. So you, that whole thing of starting to develop timing with interpersonal interaction is fantastic. There could even be a situation, and I wouldn't do it with jumping. Jumping's a little bit too difficult. But there are some situations where there are movements that are smaller movements where you might actually help the child with their body. So one of the movements is, I don't know if I have time to show this, Shireen. I know we're maybe running over time. If it's useful, definitely, I would love the parents to see. So it. let me. He has an, He has the second one in the fun stuff. So I'll show you this. Why I, I'm showing you this. Watch this briefly, and then I'll explain to you why this is important. And I'm going to do this with them. Cross the line. There. 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 That looks so simple, but there's so much stuff going on in that video with those children's bodies and their timing. So what I would do with mirror and model is, I know it looks like I'm distracted everyone, but really I have lots of screens. So if I'm looking at the side, there's nobody in this room, I promise you I'm looking at screens. <laughs> Um, with mirror and model, I would first of all watch the video again with the kids and talk about zapping the bugs, or you could talk about other things that you're doing. What could you be doing if you're doing that? There could be all kinds of other things. And the kids come up with all kinds of creative ideas. It could be there's a punching bag and a punching bag, and I'm punching the bag and I'm punching the bag. You know, there's all kinds of things that kids come up with. But in a situation where children are having a lot of trouble with the movement, if I'm a parent, and depending on the child, the size of the child, I might actually go behind the child, and because the child's body is smaller than mine, I can hold them around their wrists. And I can literally, with my body and the child's body, we can do a, a, a movement together like this. And you know, it's so much fun for kids if you're doing stuff like that. It's just fun. And I wouldn't even do it with music or, 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 or sound. I would just do it with your own voices. So it could be like, zap, front, zap, front, zap, front. And you could be like, oh no, there's more bugs. Come on, we gotta keep zapping. Zap, front, zap, front. I don't want you to just go like, zap, 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 zap. You know, the, 
Children need unstructured movement. They need to go and play in the park. They need to run around and go crazy. They need to do all kinds of crazy, silly, unstructured movement. But what I'm talking about is structured movement. So when you do this with a kid and you're holding their arms and you're doing hand over hand and you're going like this, zap, front, zap, front, zap, front. You're doing it with a rhythm. Then you could even do something like you start clapping and you go zap, front, zap, front. And you hear my voice. I'm actually using a higher sound when I say front. Zap, front, zap, front, zap, front. So you're using sounds, you're using movements, you're using your own body. There are so many strategies. And you can do all of that without even having the kid do the video. And then you can do mirror where the child's standing there and looking at you and you're standing here and you're like, okay, we've got to zap the bugs at the same time. And then let's do super slow bug zapping. Zap. Stay there. That's a big bug. We had to do a long zap. Front. Zap. Stay there. You know, you can make this a whole like fantasy play thing, especially the younger kids. Absolutely. This is really cool. Uh, but again, I'm just going to add in there because you're making it fun. You're making it very interactive. So would you advise to just, you know, come on, do this, do this. Or you're looking at make it interactive, make a story around it, give context so that they feel like this movement is purposeful for them rather than just do it because I'm asking you to do it. It's, it's got to be fun. It has to be fun. Yeah. Um, now, I, I will say I've, I've had so many reports back that children start loving the videos, so then they start asking for the video. Mm -hmm. And I would say anytime a child wants to be following along with the video, as long as they're trying to do it with the rhythm, I don't think it's worth doing it if they're going to do it randomly, like they watch the video, but then they just do it themselves. I think they really have to try and follow the rhythm. But as long as they start becoming interested in doing them, then let them do it. And, and my belief is the minimum time that they need to do it is 10 minutes. I would say 10 minutes before a reading activity in the day and then 10 minutes before a writing activity. If, if my children are going to have, I don't know how many hours a child, every child has a different calendar and schedule for the day. Every child has a different experience in their day, but every child around the whole world does some reading in their school day and they do some writing in the school day, or they should be, every child. And they might have very different languages and different kinds of writing and different curriculums, but every child needs to read and write. If, if you're going to do writing for 40 minutes or maybe 30 minutes, I would say taking some of that writing time and actually doing these rhythmic movements is going to make the rest of the writing time much more effective. So if you have a 30 minute writing period and you do a full five minutes of rhythmic movement and then you do 25 minutes of writing, that 25 minutes of writing is going to be so much more effective because you did the movement. You know, and it's the same as that research study we heard about that they did in 1997. The children that were jogging sat down to get work done and they didn't do their repetitive um, negative self-stim behaviors. And some people don't think that self-stim is negative. I think self-stim is very negative and we shouldn't just say to kids, don't do that. We've got to teach kids to regulate so that eventually they don't do that. And one of the easy ways of doing that is through rhythm. Right. And um, I, can, I can add on to that because after listening to your talks, um, I added that component into the program and I talked to parents and said, try it out uh, before the reading, before the writing, even before speech, because that's another finely coordinated activity. And there's so much of feedback coming back from parents saying, um, for some children, I had to, I could reduce the hand over hand. They were able to form those letters much better on their own. Other parents were like, the pace at which he's doing initially, it was like just a kind of thing. But now he is slowing down with the way he's controlling his movements and is able to write a lot better. So yes, there's such a benefit to including movement into the everyday and especially before these kind of tasks. 
Um, and especially rhythmic movement. Exactly. Rhythmic movement. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Um, so now you've talked about um, you have a program for it, not a program, a video that you mentioned, a series of videos. If a child has auditory and visual difficulties in integrating them, you have videos also that do not really look at you know, mixing the two up like the other yes. videos and where you can just make movement and rhythmic movements using that. Exactly. And you've talked about how you use technology so beautifully, um, but at the same time, balancing it out is not just about using technology and getting the child to sit in front of the screen, but about getting their body to move a lot more in that rhythmic pattern. So do you, would you think that the program that you do address anxieties, sensory difficulties, and that poor sense of competence that children tend to have about themselves, which then leads to that intrinsic motivation. You did speak about it a little bit about their sense of competence and, you know, they don't feel good about doing things. And so they avoid it to a large extent. So would your program be able to address these kind of issues? I definitely think that's an outcome mm -hmm. because a lot of our children are they a lot of our we, we know that children with autism and really a lot of children with special needs they have high anxiety levels for a lot of different reasons part of the reason high anxiety and so it would be high anxiety and low confidence and low motivation and that often comes about sometimes from a very early age because those children first of all often their behavior is not what we want or expect. So from a young age, they're kind of, those are the kids that are getting in trouble more. They're the kids that are getting yelled at more. And it's unfortunate, even as much as we might understand that they have special needs, they still have more negative input than other children do, just because very often people don't understand where that behavior is coming from or what they're doing. And those are very often the children from the youngest age where they're not creating the kinds of drawings that other children are. So here's the thing with paper. Children around the whole world, for the most part, unless they're in very rural areas, most children have paper that they can work with. And from a very young age, most children start doing some kind of drawing and scribbling. And it's, it's a little bit more focused on in some areas and circles and, and not much in others. But the fact is, and the only thing I have here is a little pen here or something, but I'm going to do something here. I'm just making a drawing here that looks like a person. And I don't know if you can even see it, but it's, it's really just a very rough picture of a person. Mm -hmm. So we know developmentally that at different ages, children should be able to make a drawing that somewhat represents a person is a very important developmental milestone and the way that they draw it and all the different body parts is important. But even without telling a child that, from the youngest ages, once children start gathering together in early childhood programs or in early childhood uh, you know, schools, in those early primary school levels or elementary school levels, one of the biggest problems with paper is that it's so concrete and everyone can see that. So if I am, my name is Johnny, and that's the picture I drew, and I'm seven years old, and every other seven-year-old draws their hair, and they draw the right number of fingers, and they draw toes that don't look like a bird's feet, I already know when, when the teacher decides to put everything up on the wall, and all those kids' pictures are up on the wall, I immediately know that my picture is not as good as everyone else's. And the other kids might say, oh, Johnny, look, your bird looks, your your guy looks like he has bird's feet and he has feathers as hands. Oh, you, you have a silly man, you know. That's the problem with paper. It's so concrete that from the youngest ages, children start understanding that they're not doing as well as other children. And they, that's when it starts from the youngest ages of I'm not as good. I'm not as, I don't know. So then I don't want to draw because the next time we have to draw stuff and put it up, I know immediately my, all my friends are going to tell me my picture's not good. Um, and then we have children with sensory issues where other children can all eat the same snack that everyone gets, but little Johnny doesn't like that kind of food because he hates the way that the, the, the texture is. And so every time that everyone gets that, there's a whole big problem because he's not going to eat that. So 
all of these issues, the sensory issues and the problem with development and skill level development from an early age causes a lot of problems with, with children's um, competence, feelings of competence and their anxiety. So what I would like to do is, I, I again, I've, I've been in this field for so long, I know there's no magic bullet, there's no magic program that's just going to fix all the problems at all. But my, my double approach for children's learning, the, the, two, the two approaches, the one is work on that child's brain and body. That's why I keep talking about brain body tech. Because we first of all have to, not first, we have to do these at the same time. But we have to address the child's brain and body. And there are masses of movement and coordination programs out there, but there are no programs out there for rhythm and regulation. There is one that I know of in Queensland in, the, in Australia, but it's focused very specifically at early childhood. And it's not, uh, it's, a, it's a program, but I'm, I'm not sure how it's even, if it's even available out there for everyone to use, but it's the only other rhythmic movement program that I know of. It's the reason I created all of this and put it online. So the one thing we have to do is work very extensively on the brain and the body and there are all kinds of ways we can do it. I don't just have one rhythmic movement program. I have lots. That's the reason I created that chart because I have all kinds of different parts of the rhythmic movement program. And then when we look at technology, I'll turn my iPad on again, just so I can show you the technology part of it. If we look at a child who has, as you said here in your question, I'm, I'm specifically um, talking about your this one that says, would your program be able to address the anxieties and all of these problems and then low motivation? This is where technology can become so powerful, can be so powerful for children if we use it wisely. So I'm gonna put this on the screen here and share my screen. Because when you look at technology strategies and tools, um, technology strategies and tools can help with all of these different learning areas so with writing, reading, learning and study, executive functioning. However, if we use those tools correctly, we can actually help children achieve at a much higher level. There are some tools and, and ways of using them. I'm, I'm very strongly focused on strategies. You'll see every time I talk about technology, I never just talk about an app or about a program or about a technology. I talk about strategies because the way we use it is actually the key to whether it's going to help or not. So I'll just take, for example, I'll take writing. Um, there are five different ways of children showing what they know. And if we use all of these, we can help children become a lot more effective at writing than just expecting them to handwrite on a page. This is the way most people around the most children and people around the world write handwriting on a page but we can actually teach children to use five different methods of writing to show what they know. This is an online assessment of writing. The reason I'm telling you about this is because the five methods of writing will be here and children can take writing assessments online with the five different methods and you can actually monitor their progress with writing over time. Um, I know it's on your recording, but that website is not available for use yet. Um, I just want to let you know about it because when we talk about the use of technology, if we use technology wisely, we can, um, we can help children write at a, at a higher level and a more effective level. We can help children read more efficiently and more fluently and with greater comprehension. But we have to use technology wisely to have that happen. So I think the two-pronged approach, the two biggest approaches to helping children achieve is to get their brains and their bodies more regulated and ready for learning, and then to use technology to help them with the gaps where they are having difficulty with the way that they're learning. And that's really what my whole approach is and the training and the, the teaching that I do is how we do all of those things with those two approaches. All right. Thank you so much, Bridget. 
Sorry, um, I went way over time. No worries. I'm sure this was so useful to the viewers. So thank you so much for explaining uh, it for everybody. I'd like to thank you so much on behalf of Bla uh, Play Street team for your valuable time and sharing all this knowledge with us. Um, I hope all the viewers are really now able to understand the importance of movement and rhythm and how much difficulty our children with autism have for the same and why we should work on it. And since everything we do in life is movement based and rhythmic, I, and if we only tend to work on the skills at a superficial level, then our children are bound to get frustrated because we're not really helping them with the core issues. So mm -hmm. this is the reason we wanted to connect as part of our theme, the importance of relationships, movement and consciousness together to look at, chi at the child at a deeper level and help them be the best versions of, the self, of themselves so that you know, they build their self-confidence and their sense of competence and they feel good about themselves so that they want to do more. Um, I hope today you've all gotten more ideas uh, from Bridget and how you could put together strategies to help our children take these small successful steps every day. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Shereen.